Good morning. Welcome to Adventure. We're so glad that you're here. Happy Palm Sunday and happy first Sunday of the month. So our kids are front and center. And if you are a kid at heart or another kid yourself, we have these cool dots. We're so glad you guys are doing a great job. I love it. They're already there. So we'd love to have you stand and join us as we kick off service this morning with a rattle. We're so glad you're here. ever stopped you Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb Since when has impossible ever stopped you This is the sound of dry bones rattling this is a praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire, stirring something new. Leslie had already said, it's the first Sunday of the month, which means our kids in kindergarten and up are here in service with us. Welcome, kids. 
And uh, yeah, that's right. Yay. And um, today is Palm Sunday. Here at Adventure Faith, we have a yearly tradition that we do every Palm Sunday where the kids lead us in a parade of palms while we sing a song called Hosanna in the Highest. And so what we're going to do is during the announcements, we are going to dismiss all of the kids who want to participate out into the hallway to get their palm branches and get set up and ready. If you've been with us to practice this, you're welcome. And if you've never been here before but want to participate, literally all you have to do is wave a palm branch around. So you are welcome to join us even if you haven't participated. So at this time, we'll dismiss kids to go out into the hallway and get their palm branches while the rest of us have a seat and turn our eyes to the screen for Life and Adventure. Good morning, Adventure family. Welcome to Life at Adventure. It's Palm Sunday, which kicks off Holy Week, and Holy Week is our focus for announcements this morning. If you've been doing the Lent boxes, there is just a Sunday evening devotional this week, no Wednesday activity to make space for our special services and experiences happening this week. Our first event this week is our Maundy Thursday service. The word Maundy stems from a Latin word meaning commandment and correlates to the evening that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. Join us at 6 p.m. this Thursday, the 6th, for a short service as we take communion together and focus on Jesus' commandment to love one another. Kids are welcome at this service, and the nursery will be available for personal use as needed with a live broadcast in, this, in that room. This service will also be live streamed, but due to the participatory nature of this service, it will be a simple live stream and likely will more be like listening along than watching at times. Then on Friday, we are trying something new to us with a Good Friday Stations of the Cross experience. This is the day that we commemorate the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Join us this Friday the 7th between 4 to 7 p.m. if you'd like to explore, experience, and reflect more fully on the importance of this night. Walking through the stations invites us to reflect together on the sufferings of Christ as we journey with him to the cross. There are interactive elements that engage all of our senses and reflective prompts to walk through on your own, with a friend, or with your family. Please feel free to bring kids to this experience and explain the parts as you go. This will be held in the Friendship Center and there will be little booklets and clear signage to help you navigate each step of the way. Expect this experience to take about a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, and you are welcome to do it at any point in the three hours it is open. Then this Friday, the 7th at 7 p.m., join us for our Good Friday service as we do service in the Worship Center in the round, reflecting on the Stations of the Cross and Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. Just like with Maundy Thursday, this service will be broadcast live, but due to the participatory nature um, and the lights dimming as service progresses, our live stream will likely be more simple and more like listening along than watching at times. Children are welcome at this service and we have intentional ways for them to participate with us as the lights get dimmer. Uh, the nursery will not be staffed but will be available for personal use as needed and a live broadcast will be available in that room. Last but certainly not least, we have our Easter services one week from today on Sunday the 9th at 9 and 11. Easter is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Join us in praise and worship on this very holy day. Kids are welcome in the main service or welcome in our adventure kids classes downstairs at either time. And that is Holy Week, the 6th at 6 for Monday Thursday, the 7th from 4 to 7 for the experience, the 7th at 7 for Good Friday, and then Sunday the 9th at 9 and 11. If you have any questions about Holy Week, feel free to email me at sam at faithadventure.com. For all other upcoming events or the link to the preschool fundraiser with sweet adventure preschool gear, please visit the weekly newsletter linked right at the top of our website homepage or on the This Week tab of the Adventure app. And with that, whether you're in the Friendship Center, the Worship Center, live with us online or later on YouTube or the app, we are just so glad that you've chosen to join us in worship today. You are welcome to remain seated while the kids come in singing Hosanna.
next song, you are welcome to stand and join us. The kids are going to lead us in a song called The Lord's Prayer that they learned some hand motions to um, a while back. And so why don't you stand and join us while we sing The Lord's Prayer. Thank you so much, kids. And at this time, we're going to dismiss our discoverers and explorers classes to go back downstairs with their teachers. Uh, adults, you can have a seat. <laughs> um, and the rest of our kids are going to be welcomed to find a seat on one of the dots. I'm going to welcome up a friend up here. On the first Sunday, when we have our kids in kindergarten and up, up here with us, we always do a special message for kids. And it's been me who's been doing that a lot of the time. But I'm going to welcome my friend Sandy Lewis up here. And she is going to give our children's lesson. Um, there are, hey, kids, I got to tell you, there are some of you who um, your parents learned about Jesus from my friend Sandy. It's true. She loves to teach kids about Jesus, and she is here to talk with you this morning. So if you could give her your attention, she's going to teach us. All right. Thanks, Sandy. Oh, good morning. I'm going to prepare for this. Okay. 
Okay. Am I talking loud enough? Oh. No. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, down the stairs in Adventure Kids for the last month or so, we have been learning a lot about Jesus, about the really important times in his life, because we're in a season right now that we call Lent, and it's a time that we want to just focus on Jesus as much as we can and think about the things that he came to teach us. So we've been looking at the important times in his life, his birth, his dedication in the temple, his baptism, the time he was tempted by Satan in the desert, how he chose his disciples, and then about his death on the cross and his resurrection. And our key passage, which is also our memory verse, and if anybody remembers it, you can say it with me, it's from uh, 1 John 29, I'm sorry, John 1 29, and it goes something like this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that's just a little, a little recap of what we've been studying downstairs. Up here, Pastor CJ has been teaching us for the last couple weeks about a man named Stephen, who was a follower of Jesus, and he uh, was a participant in the early church that was formed right after Jesus died and then rose again. So this is like within the first year after that happened, the early church, which was led by Jesus' disciples, was growing and growing and growing, and Stephen was one of its members. And he was someone who really knew how to love people the way that Jesus taught us to, by making sure that people who were in need, and especially people who didn't have anyone to provide for them, would be taken care of and would have food to eat. And we have people like that in our church today who love the way Jesus taught us to love and help to take care of people and meet their needs. And we call those people deacons. Have you guys heard of deacons in our church? Yeah, Anya, you have... You know someone personally, right, who's a deacon? Yeah. Okay, so in the book of Acts, this is what we learn about Stephen. He was a man who was full of faith. He really, really believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. God lived inside him and helped him know what to do every day, know what to say every day. And he was also full of grace. That's maybe loving people even when they weren't lovable. And he was full of power. He had the Holy Spirit charging him every day, charging him up to do what he knew God wanted him to do. Well, one of the things that he did was he talked to people about Jesus with a lot of enthusiasm everywhere he went. And so the Jewish leaders, who were the same people who had tried to put an end to the church by crucifying Jesus, they heard what he was saying, and they decided that he spelled trouble for them because, once again, they didn't want anybody else being in charge. They wanted to be in charge of how people lived their lives. And they had a way to do it. They, they, their, their Hebrew uh, heritage, their faith in the one true God had been written in their history. But Stephen was about to remind them that things had changed. So, whenever they heard Stephen and they wanted to argue with him about what he was saying, that Jesus was the Son of God, and that Jesus came to fulfill prophecy, he was such a, good, he was such a powerful speaker that the Jewish leaders could never win an argument. They, their words couldn't stand against Stephen's. And they didn't like it. They didn't like it that he got the best of them. So, they decided they'd have kind of a trial, like... Jesus had a trial when they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They brought Stephen to trial, and they planted some guys in the room who were willing to, to testify that Stephen was lying. They called it blaspheming. It just means telling lies, and that he was saying things that weren't true. But um, here's the thing. He, he, was say, he, wasn't, he wasn't telling lies. He was telling the truth as God told it to him. So, here's the thing. They told the council that he lied about the faith of the Jews, that he lied against God's holy law, and 
he told them that Jesus said he would destroy the temple and would change all the laws that Moses had given them. So the high priest who was in charge of this trial asked Stephen if those things that he had said were true. And Stephen told them yes by way of a very long answer. So he spoke of many, many things that um, the leaders in this room were quite familiar with. It was all about the history of how God had loved and led the Jewish people right up to the time of Jesus. But the council still decided, just like they had with Jesus, that it was a lie. They couldn't accept what they heard from Jesus or Stephen, that it was true, even though it was. The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus had changed everything, and Stephen knew it. So he spoke to the council about all these things that they knew were true, and they couldn't argue with him because they, it was all a part of their recorded history in the scriptures, and they knew the scriptures very well. So like Jesus, they put Stephen to death. The council was determined not to lose control of the people, and they would do anything to stop Jesus and others from telling all that they knew. So when Stephen finished speaking after his long answer to them, the Jewish leaders were really mad, and the Bible says they were so mad that they actually growled at him. What the Bible says is that they gnashed their teeth. That's kind of what dogs do, you know, when they, when they are kind of being vicious. And so even though, yes, very angry, and just like threatening, okay? This is, what the, this is what the Jewish leaders and the people in the room were doing. They were growling at him. But Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit, he just told them that he could see God's glory and that he could see Jesus standing right next to God. So then the people began shouting and covering their ears. They didn't want to hear it. And they grabbed Stephen and they took him out of Jerusalem and they were throwing rocks at him because they had decided he needed to die. And the weapons they used were rocks. They weren't little rocks. They were big rocks. And they hurt and they harmed and they injured Stephen when they hurt him. I imagine they were, you know, it actually doesn't take a very big rock to hurt somebody, but I imagine they were at least that big and some bigger, about like that. No, well, they had to be um, not too heavy to pick up, so they couldn't have been that big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So while this was happening, while this was happening, while he was being hit by rocks that were hurting him really badly, um, this, is what, this is what Stephen said. He cried out, praying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew he was going to die, and he wanted, he wanted to, Jesus to know that he wanted to come to him. And the very last thing he said to, just before he died was, um, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Now, I don't know about you, but that reminds me of somebody else who said words like that to the people who were responsible for killing him. Do you know who it was? It was Jesus. Yeah. Jesus said when he was on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the last thing he said before he died was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So I got a question for you guys. Have you ever, I just want you to think about this, think about how you might have felt. If you've ever been accused of something that you didn't do, think about how that made you feel or how it might make you feel. And think about how you reacted. Yeah. Then think about Jesus. He was accused of something he didn't do. Well, as Pastor CJ reminded me, actually, he did do it, but it was true. He was God. And he received the punishment, and he responded with humility and love and kindness, even to those who were nailing him to the cross. So when we follow Jesus and live how he's asked us to, Sometimes we could be treated really badly and people might accuse us of things that may or may not be true. If we find ourselves in that situation, our response needs to be loving and humble and filled with grace, even for those who might accuse us and treat us badly. 
So I have something for you guys. And I'm going to pass this around. And if you would each take one, these are just little, little glass stones to remind you of the story of Stephen. You can start, sweetie. And um, you'll see that they kind of reflect light. The light kind of shines when you move them around. And I just thought that would be a good reminder about how Stephen reflected Jesus to the people that he came in contact with. Even the people who were stoning him to death got to get a glimpse of who Jesus was in Stephen. And when we follow Jesus and live how he's asked us to, and we understand how much God loved us by sending Jesus to save us from our sins, it leads us to want to serve him by the way we serve and care for and love the people in our church, the people in our community, and the people in our world. Okay, you guys can just finish passing that quietly. We're gonna close with prayer, okay? Amazing God, loving Father, you are our teacher, our guide, and our example. Thank you for being a God who sent his son to show us and tell us what it looks like to love one another. Please help us show a love that reflects how you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. So I've been looking forward to this artist for, oh man, since we started this, looking through these paintings recently. Um, but of course, I wasn't paying attention when I picked this piece of art to which Sunday it would be, because if you're going to share about this particular artist, he has quite a story. So I tried to make it uh, PG, So the, because the kids, the kids are in the room. So this painting this is called The Taking of Christ by Caravaggio. Um, He's one of the most colorful artists of his time, and we aren't talking about paint colors at all. Uh, biographer Andrew Graham Dixon said, Caravaggio lived his life as if there were only carnival and Lent, with nothing in between. When he was painting, he, he painted with a laser focus, but when he, when he finished, the commission check had come in, he would drink and carouse and brawl for months at a time. He was passionate, and he had a violent temper, which led him to be fiercely competitive, and he talked a lot of smack about other rival artists. Uh, when he would go on his benders, he, would, he, would, he was said to go around for a month or two, and he'd have a sword at his side from one place to the next, ever ready to engage in a fight or an argument. Eventually, this led in 1605 to him. He, he stabbed a man, and he got arrested for it, um, but his patrons bailed him out, uh, only to have another altercation with an officer who stopped Caravaggio to, to question him about some other crime that he'd supposedly had committed. And something mysteriously happened, like apparently a big rock fell from a roof and hit the officer on his head during that interrogation. 
At least that was the story told by Car Caravaggio and his friends who witnessed the event. He was then taken into custody and he was tortured in this Roman jail and his friends coordinated his escape. And he lived as a fugitive, uh, uh, but he continued painting while he was a fugitive. He'd hide and get paints and he'd paint and he'd sell them. But he just kept getting into trouble. After a night where he was out gambling, uh, on a, betting on a tennis game, he ended up murdering a man who was officially charged. He fled to Naples, and here he painted like never before. And in 1607, he left Naples for Malta, where he got into another brawl, and he'd shot some guy. He was arrested again, and he had uh, escaped by climbing down 200-foot cliff uh, to the shore below, and he swam three miles around the island, and he boarded a boat for Sicily. And throughout all this time in hiding, he was painting furiously. Um, he produced paintings, and he, and he was also, in addition to paintings, he'd send paintings to Rome. He was petitioning for a pardon from the Pope. Um, Rome ended up giving him a hearing for his uh, pardon, and he, on his way to the hearing, he went out again one night. He was found the next morning lying fatally ill on a beach. He was taken to the hospital and died a few, year, a few uh, days later. He was 38 years old. Uh, soon after his death, the Pope granted Caravaggio's pardon, and to be honest with you, I don't know why. I mean, as an artist, Caravaggio is known for combining the realistic observation of the physical and the emotional human situation with dramatic use of lightning. If you look on your bulletin, it's on there. It's amazing. He made the, the technique of darkening shadows and transfixing objects and bright shafts of light is his dominant stylistic element. The painting we're looking at this morning has almost as interesting a story as its painter. It was painted in 1602 by Caravaggio as a commission for a Roman city official, uh, Sirico Matai. It stayed in the Matai family for 200 years. Uh, but as it was handed down over the years, by the second half of the 18th century, Car Caravaggio's name was no longer attached to the painting. At this time, many paintings were uh, in the Matai collection were reattributed to a Dutch artist, um, Gerrit von Honthorst. And in 1802, the painting was sold to a wealthy Scottish art collector in Rome. And it remained in that family for 119 years until it was sold at auction, and then in 1924, it was bought and brought to Ireland. And it was considered just, it was a piece of work, but it wasn't anything special. So they put it in a dining room of the Jesuit fathers of Leeson Street in Dublin, and these guys just ate breakfast in front of this masterpiece for years. And there it hung, misattributed. It was given to another artist for 50 years. Well, in 1990, the Jesuit house, they realized they were being donated a lot of these pieces of work, artwork, and they said, you know, we need to make sure our insurance will cover these. So they brought in an assessor, a conservator, and said, uh, can you assess the value of all the paintings in here? And when he looked at that painting, he had remembered, he'd read in an early biography of Caravaggio, a painting that was described like this. And he wondered, could this be that painting? So after three years of meticulous research and analysis and consultation with international exports, the piece was finally authenticated as being the one painted by Caravaggio back in 1602. It's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? But we still haven't even talked about the painting itself. I mean, in the image, we see Jesus being kissed by Judas, portrayed by one of his 12 disciples. You can see the, the reluctance that seems to be on Christ's face as, he, as the kiss seems almost like an assault rather than a welcome sign of affection. Christ's eyes are downcast, his hands are folded, waiting to be bound and taken into custody. Caravaggio does a, a close-up in the image, uh, drawing the viewer into the piece. In doing so, arms and legs of the characters are, are out of the frame. On the right, you see three Roman soldiers enter in to arrest Christ, their armor shining in the moonlight. Behind Christ, you see this guy running away. It's the Apostle John, seemingly in terror. Now, we know that all of the disciples fled the scene, and he's highlighting that. So we should be really, really confused about this other character who is amongst the Roman soldiers. He's being drawn into the scene, and he's not fleeing at all. This figure here holding up the lamp is Caravaggio himself. He frequently painted himself into his art. And in this piece, you see that he seems compelled by Jesus, holding up a lantern to see the scene better, seeking to understand makes us ask questions like, was Caravaggio wrestling with his own relationship with Christ? Questioning whether or not the grace of Christ extended all the way to him? Maybe forgiving his every sin? 
Now, unfortunately, with Caravaggio, we don't have any journals. He didn't write at all. all in fact, his, his story is told chiefly through witness statements and documentation from his many crimes. That's how he traced his life. He left no journals, but his artwork spoke volumes about his interest in Christ and the salvation he brought through his death, resurrection, and reign. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a scene that Caravaggio would have known very well. It, was, it ends up in a courtroom. He knew about those. Stephen stands accused of a crime, and, but unlike Caravaggio, Stephen did not commit the crime he was charged with. We're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 6 again, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 6. We're going to continue this story about Stephen, the, the character we highlighted last week, but this week we get to see what happens every time we see flourishing occur in the early church. Persecution raises its ugly head. If you don't have a Bible, please find one in the seat pocket in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, please keep that one. It's our gift to you. We're going to pick it up, kind of backpedal a little bit, at uh, chapter or verse 8. So it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So all of these people, we talked about this before, are from different synagogues, come together, and they argue with the testimony of Stephen. But they're unable to stand up against him because the spirit has so empowered his words. Uh, they're unable to defeat him through argumentation, and so these leaders move to a more unscrupulous method. Uh, verse 11, it says, and then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. It's funny, the adverb then at the beginning here starts, uh, indicates that Stephen's enemies, they took prompt action. When they realized they weren't going to win this argument, they persuaded a couple of people to testify against Stephen in secret. Now remember, Luke is writing this story, and he's not a narrator who's sitting on the side like a, a reporter telling what happened, or he's not, he's not telling a story that he makes up in his head. He retells events that actually happened in a way to highlight aspects of the kingdom of heaven and what happens when it comes up against the sinful elements of this world. So these leaders could not present a good argument to Stephen. They, he refute all of them. So their, their pursuit isn't justice or truth. What's happening here in these guys' heart is that they have this desire to hold on to that which they believe at all costs. They want, to win, they want to win no matter what. Now, as followers of Jesus, a good way to tell whether or not we are straying from the path of Jesus is to reflect on the methods we go about proclaiming that truth. If our methods are sinful, we've, we've stepped off course. Even if what we seek to do is truth, is right, is just, but the method, the way we seek to pursue it is, is tainted with sin, then we're not following in the footsteps of Jesus. In fact, these leaders secretly had to drum up witnesses against Stephen. It tells us so much about their character. They are, they're really not interested in glorifying God here. They don't care about their fellow man, these guys that they, they get to lie. They're willing to allow these men to break one of the Ten Commandments to provide false testimony. And they have them do it right there in the temple. They knew it was wrong. They knew what they were doing wasn't honoring to God, and yet they did it anyway. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when the Lord gives us direction and understanding or a calling or a mission, I have a tendency sometimes where I can get single-minded in that pursuit. Anybody else? That we, what happens a lot of times is we can get off our path because we're trying to achieve this mission, but the way in which we go about it can be a problem. I can remember... Uh, Many years ago, when I was in San Jose, there was a group of, of men who were going on a, a retreat, and one of the elders of the church was on the phone with an organization that was organizing the event, and he was very frustrated because uh, there were some mistakes made in our registration. You know, he was just trying to get this person on the other end of the line to uh, honor some registrations that were turned in and that they, they had lost. That's what had happened. And he was doing it because these three guys that, were, that didn't, their registration didn't go through, they were guys that we'd been praying for and working with for a long time, trying to encourage them into the life, the body of the church. And they'd finally registered, and they were like, okay, this, this has to happen. So it was for a, a really good reason. But the, I remember thinking as I heard him just screaming into the phone at this person, 
Do the ends justify the means? Now, that's not an ethic we participate in in the kingdom of God. That's not what Jesus did. When he confronted the religious leaders in his day, it wasn't to go through them in order to minister to the masses. Jesus ministered to those in front of him up till the very end. He never went through one person to minister to another. Now, when we seek to follow the Lord, whether it be through leading a ministry or even in our own personal pursuit of God, we need to be wise about how we do it because the how matters. I remember about 20 years ago, I went through this enlightenment in my faith. I was pouring over the scriptures of God, and, I was, and I, God just lit a fire in me. I was passionate. But early on, my, my passion, my excitement, my desire to be faithful and obedient with, to God led me to getting into a lot of arguments with people, especially with other Christians who didn't agree with me because I knew it all. If I'm honest, I lost some friendships. I was trying to do what was right, but I did it in a way that left this wake of bodies behind me. We don't see that in the life and work of Jesus. That's not how we're called to be. We don't go through people to minister to other people. Does that make sense? We don't use one group of people or even see one person as expendable for the sake of another group. That's not the way of Jesus. Every person matters. Remember the lost sheep? So these religious leaders in Acts 6 may think that they're doing what's right. But the way in which they're doing it is sinful. Their mission to win the argument and keep the status quo caused them to go through these men, through Stephen, honestly, through the law and through the temple as well. That that's the reason they were trying to protect him. Their initial desire was to uphold the law, to revere the temple, to honor God, but they got off track. And they ended up sinning against those very things they were seeking to save. So these leaders accused Stephen of blasphemy. It means that the They believed that the beliefs of Stephen were heretical. They didn't hold to the truth of the Hebrew scriptures. Now make no mistake, when he's accused of speaking against Moses and God, what they mean is the law and the temple. The early Christians' relationship to the temple and the law are the the two points where the spirit-filled church ambiguously relates to the rest of Judaism. It's It's a tension point. In Israel, blasphemy called for the most severe of punishments. The verbs used in verse 11, heard and speak, they they translate actually better as we've heard him constantly speaking blasphemous words. This wasn't just a one-time accusation, but an accusation saying that this is essentially all Stephen was doing. All he was doing is constantly speaking out against the law and against the temple. Like I said, the charges against Stephen focused as they were on the temple and the law are similar to the same charges brought up on Jesus. That was... What was it that Stephen was specifically teaching that caused them so much frustration? Where did the law of Moses and the temple intersect? It it intersects on the sacrifices made in the temple. The sacrifices for sin and for guilt on on the day of atonement itself. You see, Stephen was teaching that believing in Jesus as the only one who saves from sins implies that the sins of Israel are no longer atoned for through the animal sacrifices, that, and that purity is no longer established by rituals prescribed in the law, but rather on account of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation. Stephen also made these bold claims where he'd say that holiness came not through ritual sacrifice, but through the power of the Holy Spirit's work uh, in the hearts of believers. Now understand that there are aspects at the heart of Jewish life that could not coexist with Jesus in this way. If Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, what about the other sacrifices they were making? And we know there was a reason why the veil tore in two when Christ died. We know that there, is no, there was no going back to the sacrificial system, but that's for followers of Jesus. What we see here in this passage is that the early church is coming into conflict with some of the most important aspects of the faith of Jews. And they're being told that, these Jews are being told that they no longer need to do these practices. In fact, they're telling them that they don't have value anymore. In fact, they're telling them that they're not efficacious at all. They don't work. So it goes on in verse 12. It says, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him, Stephen, and seized him and brought him before the council. These leaders did four things. They stirred up people. They confronted him. They seized him. They took him to the Sanhedrin. Remember, this was the highest court in the Jewish world. This meant that Stephen was arrested. They didn't gather every day, so he was arrested. He was thrown in jail. He wasn't freed, which is an interesting thing to think about. 
when the others were earlier, he was held in prison until the Sanhedrin was gathered. Then he was presented to them to plead his case. If you're interested in what the courtroom looked like, I found a picture kind of what it's supposed to look like. It looks something like this. It's also in the Digging Deeper thing if you download that on the app. The 70 members of the Sanhedrin would be divided on either side of the accused person who would stand in front of the high priest. Behind them would be the clerks who would record things, or if they wanted a piece of scripture read out loud, they would, they would be the person that looked it up to read it word for word. Um, there could easily be a hundred, uh, there was a bunch of students of the members of the Sanhedrin, and there could easily have been 150 people in the room, possibly more. And in the middle of that room, the accused stands alone, surrounded by those accusing him. And this is where Stephen finds himself. Verse 13. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. So into this room, these leaders from the various synagogues bring more false witnesses who now stand among the, the priest's courtyard in the temple, inside the temple, breaking the law, accusing Stephen of speaking against the holy place and this law. Note that they now refer to God as Mo and Moses as this holy place and the law. You can see the hypocrisy in all of this. Honestly, when we read this, it shouldn't just go, oh yeah, they falsely accused him. It should make us sick. They've gotten so far off the path. They've dishonored both the law and the temple with this accusation. Luke calls these people false witnesses. I think he does it for two reasons. One, because they likely could not get their testimony to agree under cross-examination. That was the definition of a false witness back then. You, if you interview them, they say one thing, cross-examine them, and they mess it up, then it doesn't, they count as a false witness. But I think also he's saying that um, they were false witnesses because they weren't speaking what was true. Because Stephen was speaking truth. Already, the reader, as we read this, should be drawing connections between Christ and Stephen, and that's very intentional on Luke's part. Both spoke the truth of the gospel. Both were accused of speaking against the temple and the law. Both were falsely accused. Both spoke as prophets like Moses, as promised in Isaiah, but they listened with, or the Jews listened with uncircumcised ears, unable to hear the words of God spoken through his prophets, through God himself and Jesus. So those accusing Stephen see the connection. In fact, look at verse 14. They even almost flat out call it out. They say, for we've heard him say that this Jesus, derogatory, this Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. First part of the charge is what was used in Jesus' trial in Matthew 26, where a false witness comes forward and says that this man says, uh, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Now, Jesus didn't say that exactly, actually. I mean, he foretells of its destruction in Matthew and Luke. But in John, it's clear that he's speaking about the temple being his own body. In fact, John says that very clear. Nowhere, actually, if you look at all the sayings of Jesus, does he say that he himself wanted to destroy the temple. The second part of the accusation charges Stephen with announcing changes in the law that are due to Jesus' life and significant. He's not, significance. He's not charged with wanting to abolish the law, but with changing the customs that the law stipulated for Israel. So though Jesus and the early Christians changed how they observed the law, did they think that the law had to be abolished? They didn't. What did Jesus say about the law in Matthew 5? I came that it might be fulfilled, right? Luke does not tell his readers what specifically uh, Stephen taught regarding Jesus' statements about the temple and the law, but, or what Stephen himself taught. But it's plausible, however, to assume that Stephen spoke about the results of Jesus' life, about his death and his resurrection, and for the validity of the law in the terms of sacrifice, the atonement for sin, how holiness was going to be achieved through the Holy Spirit now. I think, honestly, though, that all of these accusations actually have very little to do with specifics. I think Stephen was accused primarily because he looked so much like Jesus. The words that he said, the things that he do, did, the ministry that he was doing, these, he looked like Jesus. We've talked about this before, that the point of following a teacher, the point of being a disciple of a rabbi, was to become like that rabbi. And if Jesus is our rabbi, our desire is to look and sound increasingly like him. That's the pathway for a believer, for a disciple of Jesus. See, I love that this came up today 
And we talked about Caravaggio earlier. I was gonna skip over his story, but I can't. Do you know that Caravaggio, all told, painted at least a dozen paintings of Christ? I don't think you can look at his body of work and not say, this man is clearly interested in Jesus. I think he's taken with him. For what we see in Caravaggio's life, there's little indication that he walked in, a, in the way of Jesus, is there? He didn't walk in a way wanting to be his disciple. It takes, and it takes more than interest in Jesus, more than just a mere belief that Jesus exists. What Luke does in these passages is he tells us a story about a disciple, a man like us, like you and like me, who walked faithfully with Jesus, became like Jesus to such a degree that Christ's actions became his actions. Christ's words became his words. Christ's sufferings became his suffering. Stephen was a devoted follower of the way of Jesus. He was faithful and obedient. He demonstrated that his heart and his life had been transformed by the Spirit. He's a hero, an example for us to follow. But he may not be the hero we want to follow, if we're honest. I don't know about you, but following the way of Jesus, like Stephen did, it concerns me because I know how it ends. There are parts of me that wants to follow Jesus' path, but I want to take detours around the more difficult parts, maybe the more painful parts. Anybody else? Paul says in Galatians that we're to be crucified with Christ so that it's no longer I who live, but him who lives in us. Since Stephen's mindset, he'd already died. He'd already died to himself, so he was able to face his passing from this world with his head held high, knowing that he was about to be present with his Savior. He knew that, and he was freed. He believed it so much. His mind and heart and hands and his mission was so oriented on Jesus, on living like Jesus, staying on the path of Jesus, that this is where it ended up. Enter Palm Sunday. The Sunday that commemorates Jesus' ride into Jerusalem about a week before his crucifixion. I mean, we've all seen the pictures. We've heard the story so many times. It's a week before, and you can imagine the scene, Jesus coming into the city, the people praising his name. Imagine yourself as one of the disciples following after him. Perhaps you're excited in this moment. You're in the parade right next to the float. People are cheering. They follow Jesus into the city faithfully. But only a few days later, they fled from it in fear. Jesus rode into Jerusalem like a hero, but he'd be hung on a cross like a criminal by the end of the week. The disciples, his followers, they scatter. The way of Jesus proved too difficult, too frightening, too costly, so they all fled. Here in Acts 6, Luke gives us a different story with a different outcome. The path Stephen walks is the same path that Jesus walked. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen endures where others had failed. How? See, Stephen saw that even death could not stop the kingdom from breaking through. In light of what he'd seen and heard, the things of this world, even his very life on this planet, paled in comparison to the truth he knew. Knowing that Christ had died and risen changed everything for Stephen. Now sometimes... I don't know about you, but I need reminding about what lies at the core of what we believe. I think this is why Jesus, in his loving kindness, instituted the Lord's Supper. So that we might be reminded not just about what happened, but to reorient our hearts, our minds, onto what's true. These are simple truths and things we take for granted all the time. Our Savior did come. Our Messiah did die for our sins. Our Redeemer did rise from the grave, conquering sin and death. His resurrection ushered in the kingdom of heaven that's overtaking this world, even when it doesn't look like it. And one day we know that that kingdom will be fully realized with the return of its king. Now, when we sit at the table and reflect on these things that he has us refocus on, everything in our lives becomes reoriented around these central truths. So when we do our communion together, we refocus our hearts, our minds, and our hands on what is true, what happened on the cross and in that tomb. We gather around the table reminding one another of our corporate and individual calls to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even knowing where that path leads. 
But what's funny is, even though we know where that path leads, in light of this truth, there's no other way to go. There's no other way to go. So when we listen to the words of Paul as he recounts what happened on that night, uh, when Jesus instituted communion, we see it as more than just a ritual, more than just a practice, but it's a recalibrating of our hearts and our minds onto that which, which is true, absolutely true. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says that when the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread, when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a reorientation onto the mission of God. What happened? and How does that impact our day-to-day lives? So this is a callback each and every time we come to this table. This world tries to cause us to step off the path, to go a different way, to doubt that which we know to be true. By coming to the table, remembering our God and what he's done, we remind ourselves of the path we're to walk. In a moment, we're going to call you to come forward for communion. We will ask that the first row of each section stand and exit their rows towards the windows. Come forward, receive the communion supplies, then return to their seats uh, with their supplies via the aisle towards the center of the room. Now, when you come to one of the tables, you'll see a plate with bread and a tray with cups of grape juice. If you're gluten-free or want to continue taking one of those all-in-one cups, they are available on the, in a bowl on the table. Please take a piece of bread and a cup for every person in your family. Parents, please assist your children. Do not feel rushed to take these components. Communion will go on as long as it has to, giving everyone time. If you cannot come forward to receive the bread and cup, and we, uh, there's somebody that's looking for you, and they will uh, bring you anything that you need. Now, when you return to your seat, don't stress about having it to be silent in here. Uh, Spend some time with your children explaining the meaning behind this holy meal. While we wait for others, spend some time in prayer. You see, we believe this table is for sinful people who are forgiven in Christ Jesus. We We come to the table as sinners in need and we partake at the table, recognizing that we are indeed forgiven. At the table, we're all equal, we're all unworthy, And through Christ, we're all welcome. Please join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to remember the cost of our sin and your love for us. Thank you that it's through your payment for our sin that we can even come to this table. And that through your blood, we're given life to live as we were meant to in this world, like Stephen did. Remind us this morning that you are present here with us and have paid the price for the sin between you and us and between us and one another. Father, we ask you to hear us as we pray how you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we're invited to come together around this table as those who belong to the household of Christ, brothers and sisters in fellowship with one another, in pursuit of Christ together, living out the death and resurrection of Jesus in his present kingdom until he comes again. We're a biblical community, a family, redeemed and beloved, living in perfect grace, rooted in sacrificial love. So we invite you to come, taste and see, that the Lord is good. Amen.
before we take the bread, let's take a moment individually to go to the Lord and confess to him sins you've committed, sins you may continue to commit, trusting in his mercy and grace and knowing that through Christ, our sin does not have to separate us from him or from one another. The price has been paid and freedom from sin is available to us if we will but confess and repent. So take a moment silently and go before the Lord. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, take and eat. In Christ, we're also pardoned of our sin. We are purified, forgiven, redeemed through the blood of Christ. So let's take a moment equally and embrace that reality. You are forgiven, made new. You are not what you've done or what has been done to you. Take a moment and reflect on these things for a second. blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, each time we take communion, we want to recommit our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, our everything to you. Fill us today with your powerful spirit. As this bread and this cup abide in our bodies, may we abide in you. Our desire as individuals, as your church, is to bring glory to your name, to bear fruit for your kingdom. Help us to focus our eyes on you, transform our hearts, renew our minds, humble us and help us to strive again to be active in our pursuit of you. May we be people who bear witness to you and your kingdom, boldly sharing what we've seen and heard in you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us as we continue in worship, uh, singing a song that just really celebrates the transformative power of God. Uh, We're going to continue with Graves in the Gardens.
We just thank you for the gift of your son, that you would send him and sacrifice him for us who could never earn it or deserve it. We're broken and we try and we fail and you still reach out for us no matter how many times. It's easy to fall into that trap that, you know, we're better than those Israelites who were in the desert and watched all your miracles and still sinned. But we're not. We're the same as them. Um, and you still reach out for us every day. We just thank you for that. God, we ask that you draw us closer to you and you help us to be transformed the way Stephen was transformed, that we can reflect that light to the world and that they'll say of us in some later day that we were filled with your grace and your power um, and that we changed people by our example. Um, and that you reached through us to people. God, we just ask that you bless the gifts and the givers today um, as people give of their time and of their money, um, that you would use that to further your kingdom and draw more people close to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I would like to invite the kids to come up and help us out with our last song. Um, you guys know it. It's Sing Wherever I Go. So I expect dancing and singing. You don't have to if you don't want to. I promise. I won't be mad.
soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All right. Let's, let's thank the kids again for leading us in worship today, guys. You did a great job. Thank you. Good job. All right. Um, if you have been in adventure for any amount of time, you know that we have a love-hate relationship with the Navy. Anybody? Like, we love that they bring amazing people here, but they also have a tendency to send them elsewhere, which is a very frustrating because we fall in love with them, and then they take them to Guam for three years. Um, so after service, I wanted to ask you again, we've been doing this a lot lately, as if someone's being sent off somewhere else. We, we see it as them being sent off as a missionary on behalf of adventure and the kingdom at large. Um, also, you guys can join our online community. So like, hey, we could still stay in touch. But uh, the Bailey family, uh, you've seen Mark up here playing drums all the time. Um, and April and all of her kids, April volunteers downstairs with children's ministries and in youth ministries and just all around uh, amazing people. They're gonna be sorely missed, and, but they will be back in three years. <laughs> So they're going to come up after service and be down here. We're just going to lay hands on them, and we're going to pray for them before they go and send them off. So let me pray, and then we'll invite them and all the kids, too, to come on up here, and we'll lay hands on your whole family. Uh, Father God, I just thank you for this church family. I, I thank you for the Baileys. I, I thank you for the, the Navy, mostly. It's, it, it brings wonderful, incredible people into our lives, and we thank you for them, and we're thankful for the time we have. Um, we always just long for more selfishly. But, Father, you are sending them out uh, to do your work, just like you send all of us out into our uh, mission fields of our homes, of our schools, of our, of our workplaces every day. And so I just pray, Father, that you would go with us, that we would see this story of Stephen as an example for us to model. He was a human being just like us, filled with your spirit just like us, and able to, to be faithful and obedient through that spirit, to be such a reflection of you that he walked your path all the way to his death. I, I pray for that for all of us, Father, that we might follow and look so much like you that people can't help but see you in us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.